the worst kept secret in Formula One, just after George Russell's move to Mercedes, is finally out of the bag. Guan Yu Zhou will be racing alongside Valtteri Bottas at Alfa Romeo Sauber in 2022. It's finally official. He's replacing Antonio Giovinazzi. Sad, I liked Antonio, but I still don't think he did enough to really put his foot down and really make a mark in F1 over his three years. It's always risky bringing a completely fresh driver lineup, but at the same time, I would say that 22 is probably the time to do it. Brand new car platform for next year for everyone to get on top of. At the same time, you're not really gonna be carrying over as much of your car knowledge year on year. Valtteri Bottas brings a ton of experience, multiple time Formula One race winner, would push Lewis on his day, definitely, and will inevitably, I think, have a bit of a point to prove. And then you've got Guan Yu Zhou, multiple time Formula Two race winner, currently sitting P2 in the championship. What's not to love? Well, Guan Yu Zhou, he's no George Russell, he's no Lando Norris, he's no Charles Leclerc. He didn't come in to F2 and hit the ground running. He's not a young driver who's being perceived as being there on merit. He has been labeled, bestowed the title that many drivers have over the years of pay driver. So today I thought it'd be fun to kind of explore this tag, look at Joe's career and compare his to the two most recent pay drivers to jump into F1, Nicholas Latifi and Nikita Mazepin. Who had the most impressive junior career up to this stage? Does Joe deserve to be lumped in with them too? as pay drivers. Oh, quick, 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 like button. Hit the like button, all good, yeah? And uh, subscribe as well, just in case you haven't already. You might be, but you might not. So let's start by establishing why Guan Yu Zhou is considered a pay driver. I mean, there, there's two main factors. One is that it's been reported that he's bringing a significant financial injection, cash injection into that Alfa Romeo team. And by the end of this year, he will have completed three full seasons of Formula 2, possibly without winning any of them. Those are the two main components. Big money, long F2 career. Starting with the money. Guan Yu Zhou clearly comes from wealth. I mean, just look at his Instagram. He's bossing the North Face Gucci jackets and he loves, he loves a Hublot, not a Hublot. Reports have claimed that Guan Yu Zhou is able to bring about 30 million dollars or euros, depending on the source you read, into that team. He can stump that money up, whether that's personal finance or whether that's from his sponsors, which is huge. And Fred Vasseur said this was a load of nonsense, but... I wouldn't be surprised. That's about what Latifi stumped up for his initial Williams seat, I think. And also, I wouldn't be surprised if Liberty Media and FOM put, you know, a little bit of pressure maybe on Alfa Romeo Sauber to sign Joe to make him the first Chinese driver in Formula One ever. That's a huge commercial thing. There's all this talk about, you know, growing F1 in the States, but the Chinese market is just as big, maybe even bigger. If there's a competitive Chinese driver in the sport, human figures in China should skyrocket. And apparently there's talks that they want to bring a second race in China as well. Because again, let's be real, I've talked about the US. It's so big, you've got to treat it like a continent. You could argue the same with China. It is a massive country with like well over a billion people. So fair enough. Although Kyle Army should still take priority, if you ask me. Guan Yu Zhou is 22 years of age, born in Shanghai in China. He moved to the UK in like 2012 to pursue his racing career because Europe is the place to be. Particularly, you know, if you're from North America, you can stay in Indy Lights and that. But if you're in Europe, that's, yeah, a lot of Asian drivers come to Europe because that's where all the big championships are. He's competed in ADAC F4, Italian F4, Josh Revel's favourite series, the Toyota Racing Series. Big up, Josh. FIA European F3, F3 Asia, and of course, F2. In terms of his wealth from the family background, I couldn't really find much in terms of reliable sources as to where their money comes from. I think it's kind of in the motoring industry in some way, shape or form, but I can't confirm that. As for his sponsors though, again, if you look at his Instagram, there's clearly a significant relationship with Hublot. And on his S2 car this year, you've got a big presence on the side from the Henji Group. Looking into them, it looks like they're kind of a copper manufacturing company, which is be incredibly boring and dull, but no doubt they're stacked. So Joe can bring all this money coming in. Obviously Antonio's lost his seat, he's coming out. Antonio doesn't come from wealth like a lot of racing drivers do. He was supported actually a lot in his earlier career by uh, Sean Galao's family. But being picked up by the Ferrari Driver Academy, doing well in junior formulas and being Italian always helped Antonio's kind of journey into F1 initially. But after this announcement that he was losing his seat and Joe was replacing him, in Antonio's statement, he actually fully outed the reason from his point of view why Joe's getting the seat. 
F1 is emotion, talent, cars, risk, speed, but when money rules, it can be ruthless. He's not wrong. And then quickly on to Joe's three years in F2 being too many. Look, there's been so many rookies over the years who have jumped into the series in their first year and won in F2. You look at George Russell, you look at Charles Leclerc. If you manage that, you're considered top billing. If it's in your second year, like say Mick Schumacher last year, you can kind of get away with that. Okay, I think people prepared to consider, okay, you get your first year just to find your feet. Second season, you have to be winning it really. And also Mick's not the best example because obviously we know that part of the reason he's got this opportunity in F1 is his name, but he has also proven that he can drive at a very high level. So I'm not prepared to write him off yet. So to then be in your third year in the championship and not even be winning it, I know the season isn't over yet, but it doesn't look great. Even more so that the guy winning it, Piastri, is a rookie. So do I understand where the pay driver term comes from with Guang Yu Zhou? 100%, of course I do. Big money isn't winning F2, simple. But how does that stack up relative to Latifi and Mazepin? Well, let's wind the clock back to 2017 first, briefly, and then we'll go through each year up until 2021 and look at their respective seasons. 2017, Joe and Mazepin raced directly in competition with one another in the FIA Formula 3 European Championship, with Joe finishing P8, Mazepin P10. A 41-point gap in the end, five P3s for Joe, two P2s and one P3 for Nikita. 2017 was also Latifi's debut season in Formula 2, finishing fifth, pretty good. Five P3s, two P2s and one win to his name. Okay, on to 2018. Latifi in his second year of Formula 2, Guan Yu Zhou remained in FIA Formula 3 European and Nikita Mazepin had moved over to GP3. This was before the series kind of blended together. So Latifi's 2018 season in Formula 2, 24 rounds over 12 tracks following the F1 calendar. His season was all right. He finished P9, so four places lower than the year before, so not great. And only 15 drivers made every single round of the championship. In the lower formulas, you get a lot of drivers who will like sit out and come in to fill in for a few races, you know what I mean? Because it's more of a test bed. Nicky got 91 points, one P1, one P2, and one P3 over the course of the year. But to be fair, you do have to bear in mind, this 2018 F2 field was bloody quality. Russell won from Norris, from Albon, from De Vries, from Markloff, from Seti Camera. Like, that was a stacked field of talent. It was always going to be an uphill battle, but Norris and Russell were in their rookie seasons and they were one and two, so no wonder they're in F1 on merit. Mazepin's GP3 season, 18 rounds over nine different circuits, and he had a super strong year, finished second out of 26 drivers by the end. Although, again, only 15 competed in every single round. 198 points, only 16 shy of title winner, the late Antoine Hubert. Other notable drivers in this championship this year were Callum Eilat, David Beckman, Jake Hughes, Juan Manuel Correa, Tatiana Calderon, and Veloce's very own Ryan Tavita. Lovely bloke. The Keats scored four wins all season, three P2s and one P3, which is almost a 50% podium rate. He beat Callum Eilat by like 31 points. That is significant because... I mean, I rate Callum incredibly highly. I'm sure a lot of you do as well. Like, that was a very good season for Nikita Mazepin. Again, Joe in Formula 3 European, 30 rounds split over 10 circuits. So a lot more racing than Mazepin that year. He finished P8 out of 21 drivers who competed in every single round that year. Won the opening round at Pau, but then only took one more win over the rest of the year. Three P2s and one P3 in all. In terms of talent, again, there was a lot in this one. Mick Schumacher won the championship ahead of Tictum, Schwartzman, Vips and Armstrong. 2021 IndyCar winner Alex Palou finished one point ahead of Joe. Fun fact. An all right season given the caliber of the grid. Not great, but definitely not terrible. On to 2019, the one season we've seen all three drivers race together in the same championship. So we should get a direct comparison. All in Formula 2. The only caveat being that this was Latifi's third season, but Nikita and Guan Yu's first. Nicholas's third and final season in Formula 2 was pretty damn good. He finished second. Four wins, three P2s and one P3 over the course of the year. 214 points in the end, although he was 52 off of championship winner Nick De Vries, which is it's a big gap between first and second. Finished 10 points ahead of teammate Sergio Sati Camera. Not a whitewash, but ahead 
In fact, P2 in your third year of Formula 2 is the exact position we find Guan Yu Zhou in right now. But then I would argue that this year's F2 field is stronger than it was in 2019. No shade on Nicky, of course, he did a very, very good job. But the parallels are interesting. So whilst Latifi had a very strong 2019, Nikita Mazabin had not that. He finished P18 with just 11 points to his name. And who was his teammate in 2019? Nick De Vries, the man who won the championship by 52 points from Latifi. P1 and P18, that is not a good look at all in any way, shape or form. And then you learn that the only two drivers who finished behind him that completed every single round of that season were Tatiana Calderon and Mahavir Raghunathan. Not much more to say on this one. Objectively, 2019 was an absolute write-off for Nikita Mazepin. Not good. And then Joe, also in his rookie season in Formula 2, took five P3s over the course of the year, finished P7 by the end of it all with 140 points to his name. 74 behind Nikki, 129 ahead of Nikita. And his teammate was Luca Ghiotto, who finished third in the championship, 67 points ahead. Now look, I've already said I don't think the 2019 F2 grid was particularly strong, but finishing seventh isn't bad in your rookie year. In fact, Guan Yu Zhou won Rookie of the Year, the Antoine Hubert Award. So fair play, considering the experience around him, he did a good job. 2020 was, of course, a bit of a write-off year. We missed a lot of racing out, but we still got a lot of racing. All things considered, credit to the FIA, and these three all participated, Latifi in F1, Joe and Mazepin in F2. I think it's fair to say that Latifi's debut season in F1 was difficult. Granted, he got three P11s, which meant that if George hadn't had his little stint in Sakir to score three points in the Mercedes, Latifi would have actually finished ahead of George on paper. But let's be real. Nicky was nowhere near George. 16-0 in qualifying to Russell. An average margin of 0.539 seconds in qualifying. That's bigger than the average gap between Verstappen and Albon. And that was pretty bloody big. Okay, I know it hurts, but it's true. When both cars finished on 10 occasions that year, Nicholas only finished ahead of George twice. Granted, the 2020 Williams was, wasn't a great car, but it was also a lot better than the 2019 car. That was an absolute dumpster fire and the livery was trash. I'm sorry, it's just true. The car didn't allow him to really battle, but at the same time, when you look at how well George did, the 2020 season didn't exactly help alleviate that pay driver tag that Nicholas had been given in his debut year, you know. Then to Nikita, obviously his second year in Formula 2. Time to right some wrongs from a disastrous 2019 season. And credit to him, he did. He finished P5, which is a monumental turnaround considering how bad 2019 was. 58 points ahead of teammate Luca Giotto by the end of the year, 164 points in total. 61 behind title winner Mick Schumacher. He got two race wins all year and four P2s. And again, the 2020 grid for me, once again, was a step up in terms of quality relative to 2019. I mean, Nikita finished ahead of Tiktum, Drogovic, Daruvala, Lungard, Armstrong and Guan Yu Zhou. Much improved for sure, he would get the call up to F1 afterwards but finishing p18 and p5 and f2 is that enough to justify a formula one seat no but we know why he got it and finally yes of course on to joe also in his second season of f2 finished p6 one position behind nikita like i said 12.5 points was the gap between them two in the end joe got one win two p2s and three p3s over the course of the year because look his first season was good he won rookie of the year in the f2 championship and he needed to kick on he needed to be up there in 2020 to not get tarnished with this pay driver brush but to be 70 points off the title winner Mick Schumacher and still behind Nikita Mazepin is not great I mean Sonoda finished third almost second and that was his rookie year yes Joe consistently he never got thumped but he never properly excelled at the top either and then finally on to this year 2021 which of course isn't finished yet. So these results are all liable to change between now and the end of the season. 26-year-old Nicholas Latifi is of course still at Williams in his second season at the team. And you know what? It has been, I think, a pretty significant improvement. 19 races in, he scored seven points, nine behind his teammate. Yes, he's continued to take a drub in, in qualifying, although into Lagos last weekend, fair play. Nicky got the very first Q1, Q2, Q3, normal qualifying dub over George Russell. Although still finished behind him in the race. It's good, but it's still 18-1 to George this year. So is it good? Not really. 
But again, like how you consider Latifi, because Russell's been his only teammate, also depends on how good you think George is. If you think George is the next best thing since sliced bread, then you can be like, okay, fair enough, that's understandable being slapped. But if you think that George is just an okay, all right F1 driver, then it doesn't reflect well on Latifi at all. I think George is different gravy. I think he's unreal. So I'm not carrying too much into this, but we're going to learn a lot next year with Albon coming in alongside him. New teammate, new spec cars. How are they going to do against each other? If Latifi beats Albon next year, I'm never going to be able to go on Twitter ever again. 22-year-old Nikita Mazepin stepped into that Haas at the beginning of this season. And as we all are well aware, it hasn't gone great, has it? Alongside Mick Schumacher, you've got two rookies looking to adapt to this car that isn't a great car. Haas have like, they've been zero development to that car this year. And it wasn't great last year either. It's a level playing field, yet one is absolutely pumping the other. Mick has been clear of Nikita this year in all metrics. Qualifying, it's 17-2 to Mick. And the only two times that Nikita's technically qualified ahead of Mick is when Mick crashed in FP2 and couldn't even make quali. So Nikita has never beaten him on pace in qualifying all season. Again, you can kind of excuse that. You look at Gasly and Sonoda, but Gasly's got experience. He's driving the nuts off that Alpha Terry and it's been hard for Yuki. But with Mazepin, like they're both rookies and he shouldn't be doing that to you, Nikita. It's not uncommon for Mick to finish a good 30, 40 seconds up the road by the end of a race. Now, obviously, I understand that this Haas is such a fundamentally slower car than all the other cars that it's very difficult for Mick or Nikita to get an opportunity to show off their skills in wheel-to-wheel -wheel combat, apart from like on the first lap. But they're getting the same car, they've got the same hardware, and Mick is clear. Although, granted, I think Mazepin has started to close up that pace gap towards the end of the season. But that's not enough to shake the pay driver of tall from Mazepin. It's not. It's been one of the worst debut seasons in Formula One that I can remember for a long time. And finally, 22-year-old Guan Yu Zhou is in his third and final year in Formula Two. Currently sitting P2 in the championship, 142 points to his name, with six rounds to go in Jeddah and Abu Dhabi. I think. He's 36 points shy of fellow Alpine Junior Academy driver Oscar Piastri, who's in his rookie year. So again, that doesn't reflect particularly well on Joe. We know who has been the more impressive driver. But 36 points is not an insurmountable gap at all, but it's going to be hard, particularly as he probably has to worry about the gap behind him more. P3 is Robert Schwartzman, seven points behind, then Tictum, 13 behind, then Porsche, 22 behind. Joe has managed three wins, two P2s and two P3s all season. That's seven out of 17. That's getting pretty close to half races on podiums, which is decent. But once again, the problem is, even if he does turn it around and win it, this is his third year in F2. And when drivers spend three years in F2 and get a promotion to Formula One, they're going to be considered a paid driver because there's so many talented rookies out here, like Oscar Piastri, like Teo Porcher, has done a fantastic job this year as well. He's long-term possibly lined up because he's a Sauber Academy driver. The thing is with Formula Two, when you win it, you're not allowed to race in it again. So inherently, if you're racing in it three, four, five, six seasons in a row, it's because you can never win it. And when you add that Oscar is two years younger than Guan Yu Zhou, no wonder people are upset that Oscar Piastri isn't getting an opportunity when he clearly deserves it. He's done everything that Charles Leclerc, that George Russell did in F2. It was no-brainers that they got called up and Oscar should be called up as well, clearly. So there we have it. Out of the three of them, how would you kind of rank them relative? Do you think any of them deserve to be in F1? And if you're Chinese, are you excited to see Guan Yu Zhou? representing China because as much as there has been a lot of negativity around pay driver blah 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 it is going to be exciting to see a new nationality on the grids I mean for me Joe has had the slightly more impressive career than the other two but not by a country mile I mean Mazepin's 2019 was so bad it's it's very difficult to look past that at least Joe has been consistently at a good level question is have the highs been high enough alongside Bottas a teammate with as much experience as Bottas New regulations, Alfa Romeo, Sauber, want to do something half decent because they've been like, I feel like they've been P8 for about 15 years. So yeah, I am excited to see how it turns out. Did Giovinazzi deserve that seat more than Guan Yu Zhou? I mean, maybe. 
Piastri definitely deserved it the most, done a lot. I just don't think, I still don't think Antonio did enough over his three years to make himself like a, a top name. You know, I know Kimi Raikkonen in his prime was fantastic, but we haven't had prime Kimi Raikkonen, I think, for a while now. Not since like his Lotus days, I'd say. And if Antonio wanted to make it no discussion that he deserves to be in F1, he should be beating a 42-year-old Kimi Raikkonen. He's in qualifying, but rarely in the races. So, is what it is. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you this weekend for the Qatar Grand Prix. Going to be an interesting one. Um, but yeah, my name's been Tomo, as it typically is. Thanks again. Have a good one. Ta-da.